Tonight we're at chapter 22, verse 54 through 62 here in the Gospel of Luke. So let's begin reading together in Luke chapter 22 at verse 54. I'll read to verse 62 and we'll get into our study. Steps leading to denial. Luke writes in uh, chapter 22, verse 54, Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour had passed. Another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Steps leading to denial. Now, as we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, last time we were together, we saw how that, that the Apostle Peter had tried to defend the Lord Jesus Christ as he was about to be arrested. And in his attempt to, to defend him, he had pulled out a sword and he had attempted to take the head of a man by the name of Malchus off of his shoulders. And as that was all taking place, as we saw in chapter 22 at verse 51, Jesus had to stop and stop them, and he said, uh, permit even this. And so what Jesus did is he stopped them from doing that or acting out in the flesh. Uh, in, in John chapter 18, concerning the same event, uh, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? And so he says, you have to permit this. I'm here to drink of this cup. And so the point he was making is acts of violence to achieve personal ends is never to be rewarded by God. And violent protests over that which may be wrong in itself is not God's way. Because God doesn't reward taking justice into your own hands. And so Jesus said this needs to take place. You need to permit this because he had been sent in order to fulfill his Father's will as it related to salvation. He was to lay his life down on that cross, and this is all part of the plan that his Father had for salvation. And so he says, permit even this to take place. He didn't want his disciples to be regarded as violent and angry men because he came to bring a kingdom of peace and joy. He came to bring a a kingdom of righteousness and, and of the Spirit. And so if his men are out there fighting and doing battle like the world, that, that sends the wrong message to the world that he had been sent to save. So he's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. I haven't taught you to do this. I haven't taught you to be this. And I don't need man's help. We saw how in Matthew chapter 26, verses 52 and 53, Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? I really have accesses to forces that are immediately capable of annihilating the entire Roman army. Right now, I have access to 12 legions of angels. Right now, I have access to 72,000 angels. And so, I really don't need you and your, your rinky-dink sword, Peter. So, you know, put it away. Now, when this is all taking place, the reaction of the apostles is recorded for us because Mark tells us in chapter 14, verse 50, that they forsook him and they fled, even as Jesus said they would do. Because in Mark 14, verse 27, Jesus said, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the the sheep will be scattered. When Jesus was praying that night in John 16, 32, he said, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come. You will be scattered, each to his own, and you will leave me alone. And that's exactly what took place. They all forsook him and fled, even as Jesus had said. They were unwilling to suffer for him. They were unwilling to perhaps even die for him, and so they fled. And so this is all taking place, and so they've already taken off 
when it says in verse 54, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. And so the temple police and the soldiers and the others came and they led Jesus away. Luke tells us that they took him to the high priest's house, but but we know by comparing this with uh, John's gospel that the first thing they did is they actually took him to the home of the former high priest, a man by the name of Annas. He was a father-in-law to Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And Annas had served as a high priest for around four or five years, so he had considerable influence. It was Annas who was in control of the money changers and, and the ones who sold sacrifice in the temple. And, and when Jesus had come and cleansed the temple, it had infuriated him. Mark tells us in chapter 11, verse 18, the chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So Jesus was a threat to him, and Annas had an interest in this man. And so he was originally referred to or was referred to in John's gospel as the high priest, not because he is the high priest, but because he's the former high priest, and so in reference to him as a high priest, it's like saying Mr. President to an ex-president. He desired to interrogate Jesus that he might formulate a capital charge against him. He was unsuccessful, and therefore, he sends him to Caiaphas. Now, all the disciples have forsaken the Lord. They've all fled. Peter and John have decided to follow the group taking Jesus to Caiaphas' place. And, and um, at, right off the bat, I have to say that, that the apostle Peter and John were, were much more courageous than the others who had taken off, and yet they're not courageous enough. Because we see in verse 54 that Peter followed him at a distance. And he did so right into the courtyard of the high priest. And Peter is there seated with the servants. And he wants to see what's going on. And he wants to hear what's going on. But he also wants to escape notice. He doesn't want anybody to know that he's there. And so John, because he knew the high priest, was able to get him into the courtyard and uh, what happens, according to John 18, verses 15 and 16, is that John speaks to the doorkeeper, and she allows John to bring Peter into that courtyard. And there he is. You know that this is a man who is absolutely petrified. He's got to be terrified. He's got to be absolutely afraid to a great degree, because there he is in the midst of the enemy. So on the one hand, I consider that to be incredibly courageous because the others have, well, they're not there. John is there and the apostle Peter is there. But the others who had up to this point remained with Jesus, excluding Judas, none of them are there. And so I immediately don't want to cast aspersions at the apostle Peter. Frankly, he did more than the average person would have done. And there he is in the midst of the enemies of Christ. And as he's there, he's listening to what's taking place. It says in, in verse 55, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And so there he is, quietly seated there. It must have been cold that night. He wants to be warmed by the fire. And as he's there quietly trying to escape notice, verse 56 says, a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. So you can see that she's staring at him, and you can almost see the apostle as he's looking down. The glow of the fire is illuminating his features. So she's staring at him. He's probably trying to escape notice, trying to do something to blend in. But she's watching him. And as she's watching him, she recognizes him. And as she recognizes him, she makes it very clear, this man is one of the followers of Jesus Christ. She was with that man, and she pinpoints him. Now, he obviously was feeling great fear, but he more than likely thought that he could remain undetected. So he's sitting there quietly, hoping nobody's going to notice him. But here comes a woman who had allowed him in, and she begins to stare at him, and she begins to look at him as he's trying to blend in. I don't know if you've ever been in the position where you've tried to escape notice. I'm certain that most of you have. If you think for a long time, I'm sure you can come up with several instances when you've tried to get away with just blending in with the crowd and escaping notice. I, I more than one time have done that in my, in my past, especially as a non-believer, trying to escape notice of the police or somebody. But I was trying to escape notice, trying to blend in. And I know exactly what that feels like to be afraid that you're going to 
be pinpointed and all. And, and that's what's taking place. John tells us in John 18, verse 17, as she speaks, she says to him, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And so she's looking at him, and she's looking around, and she begins to speak, and she says, this man was with him. So his response immediately is one of denial. Verse 57 says, he denied him, saying, woman, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know him. That must have been quite a surprise to him to be pinpointed like that and, and to be pointed out in front of everybody else as he's there quietly hoping that nobody notices him. Now she walks up, she's staring at him, she, he sees her, he's looking down, trying to blend in, probably trying to pull in behind somebody else, but she doesn't allow him to get away. She just stares at him. And then she says, I know that you were with him. And he immediately denies. Now panic has set in. He's immediately trying to get away, and what he does is he lies. He tries to lie his way out of the problem. Because you see, that boast that he had made, and we all remember how he had said to Jesus, though, though I'll deny you, I will never deny you, I, I will even die for you. That foolish boast that he had made is ready to be ex exposed. It's going to explode right in his face. This, uh, this boast that he said that everybody else doesn't have what I have. Everybody else doesn't love you the way I do. I love you so much, I will die for you. Well, that boast, even though Jesus corrected him, even though Jesus said, oh, will you really, you're going to deny me? No, if everybody denies you, I will never deny you. Well, it's about to explode in his face. Verse 58 says, after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man... I am not. Now, we're told according to Mark chapter 14, verse 68, that he had moved away from the fire. He actually went into what we would call a long entryway in order that he might escape notice. So he got away from the fire, and he went into an entryway. According to Mark 14, 68, he went out on a porch. And as this is taking place, a rooster crowed. He's trying to hide. But once again, he's pointed out as one of Jesus' disciples. And once again, he denies it. Well, finally, verse 59 says, Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him. He's a Galilean. Now, how'd they know he was a Galilean? Was he wearing University of Galilee on a sweatshirt? You know, a little baseball hat? The Sea of Galilee? No. His accent... The apostle Peter came from the north. And as small as the nation of Israel is, they actually had accents. And you could, you could tell when somebody came from a certain region just by the way they spoke. Now, we have this immense nation. I mean, this United States is a good-sized nation. It takes us close to five hours to fly it, like four or five hundred miles an hour to get across this nation. It's a huge nation. But we can understand that there are regional dialects. We know that. I mean, you have people who live here in California. You've got such a mixture of dialects, it's kind of difficult. But you can go into some areas. You go into Texas, and most definitely they have their own way of speaking. You can go into Mississippi. They have their own way of speaking. You can go into North Carolina. They have their own way of speaking. You can go into New York. You can go into, into, into Boston. You, you can go up into, into, into Maine or New Hampshire, and, and they have their regional dialect. And as you listen to them speak, they're speaking the same language as you, but you immediately say, this guy's from Brooklyn. I mean, there's no doubt about it where this guy comes from. Or this guy's from Long Island. You can tell. Or this, this person's from, from, uh, from Boston, you know, just the way that they speak. You know, and, and, and so you can pick that up. And, and I've met people, as you have, who are from around the United States, but they sound like they're from, you know, some other country sometimes as they're speaking to you. I, I'm thinking of Rawl, but, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they have a language. They have the same English that you do, but they have a regional dialect. And, and yet, if you say, where are you from? They say, I'm an American. I'm from the United States. Well, here you have the Apostle Peter, and he's from the north, and, and the Galileans had a certain way of speaking. And so the southern, um, southern Jewish people there in the city of Jerusalem and all, as they're listening to him speak, I mean, his speech betrays him. And that's why the guy says, this guy's a Galilean. 
This person is a Galilean, and, and, and one of the Gospels goes so far as to say, you are a Galilean, your speech betrays you. We can pick it up by the way that you speak. Your accent lets us know where you're from. And so, you are from the north. Jesus is from the north. Don't deny that you're one of his followers. He's, an, he's from Nazareth himself. You are from the north. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And that gets him so upset. Now, what's interesting... I want you to notice in verse 59 again, this takes place uh, after about an hour had passed. And so for an hour, he has gotten away with it. He has sat there or stood there or whatever he's doing at that time for an hour. And, and by that time, he has had plenty of time to start thinking, maybe I've gotten away with being in here, and maybe I'm going to be able to make it without somebody uh, pointing me out. And so after an hour of being there, no doubt his, his heart has begun to, to be soothed and to be settled and everything. But here comes somebody else, and they make that positive identification. Uh, John tells us in chapter 18, verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? So the one who is speaking to him, the man, when it says man, I do not know in verse 60, that man who is speaking is an individual who knows beyond a shadow of a doubt because you're the one who cut my, my, my relative's ear off. I know who you are. I have a vested interest, and I, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the person who did that. Well, Peter is saying, I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. Once again, he lies. Now, Mark tells us in chapter 14, verse 71, he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Now, now when you read that, he began to curse and swear. A lot of people think, well, yeah, he was a fisherman. I'm sure he swore. He was a sailor. He wasn't using profanity. It's not like he started to use swear words. He wasn't cussing. He wasn't the cussing apostle. What he was doing here is he was cursing himself and swearing an oath to God, which makes it even worse because he's saying something like, may God's wrath and judgment fall upon me. I swear to God himself that I don't know him. So this is a lie and blasphemous what he's doing. It's very serious a very serious sin that he is committing. It's a lot worse than if he started using profanity. That's not what's taking place. You see, the first time I read this in a, when I was a new Christian, I thought, oh, he, if an apostle cusses and swears, I guess it's okay once in a while. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't using profanity. What he was doing, he was calling curses upon himself. And he was saying, uh, you know, anything. He's so frightened, he's saying anything to save his skin. Now, as he's still speaking, the rooster once again crows. And this is when it becomes very passionate. I want you to see verse 61. And the Lord turned, looked at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what was taking place, but Mark does. Mark tells us in chapter 14 that Jesus had been before the council and had been standing before the high priest. And while he was there, they were trying to formulate charges against him in order that they might be able to have him put to death. As Jesus was there and they were bringing up charges, trying to find a way, they began to mistreat him. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 14, verse 65, that some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. I can't emphasize dramatically enough what was taking place. The Lord Jesus Christ is being beaten and mistreated in a way that, that human beings ought not to be mistreated. Sometimes when we think in terms of him taking 
uh, you know, being struck in the face and all. We, we don't think, we really don't think about what that means. Uh, as I look out in this, this church, I, I know there are some in this room who know exactly what it feels like to get hit in the face just full on, you know. Uh, you know, I've had, I've had more than one person punch me in the head so hard that, that I went flying, you know. And that was Marie. You ought to see it when guys hit me. <laughs> you know, you've been knocked off your feet before. You ever been blindsided where well, you don't see it coming? And somebody just nails you in the side of the head or busts your mouth open. I've had that happen when I was a kid when I was in high school more than once. Just coming out of nowhere. And then before you know it, you're on the ground. You didn't even see the punch as it came. That's what they were doing to the Lord Jesus Christ. They blindfolded him. And as they blindfolded him, somebody would out of nowhere, just they, they hammered him. They hit him so hard. And they began to bust him up. That's what was taking place with Jesus. And they began to spit on his face. In the Jewish culture, one of the most insulting, humiliating things that a person could do to somebody else was to spit in their face. And, and being spat on in that way was just an absolute shame and humiliation. So they began to they hit him. They began to spit on him. They put this blindfold on him and began to abuse him. Isaiah, when he was writing concerning Messiah, a prophecy that was written 700 plus years before Christ, and he was speaking about Jesus. He was speaking about the Messiah of Israel. Well, Isaiah in chapter 52, verse 14 said, concerning Messiah, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. They hit him. They beat him. And this was just the beginning of the torture. And so what had happened is Jesus had been taken, and as he was there before the high priest, and as they were trying to draw from him a confession, they ultimately were able to use something against him, and once they heard him say something acknowledging what their accusation was, they unleashed on him their fury. And so Jesus has been there, and now they've removed him. And as they're removing him and taking him to another place, that's what's taking place with the apostle Peter. The apostle Peter had been by the fire. He had moved into an entryway. He's been denying the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to remain quiet so that nobody notices him. But as all of this is taking place, Jesus, who has been beaten and, and his face is now bruised and it's bloody, and there's spit just dripping off of his beard as they've been harming him and hurting him, as he's being led away, the apostle Peter and, and Jesus lock eyes. And, and that's what he's saying here. It says in verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now that look... That, the, that, that, that Jesus gave to the apostle Peter was a gaze. It was, a, you know, the word look there in the, in the original language speaks of a searching gaze. It was the Lord Jesus Christ not just giving a, 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 just a passing glance. You, you have to see what's taking place here. It, it, Jesus isn't just glancing in his direction as you do when you're driving and there's a car next to you and they drive by and you might glance towards them. And you don't really pay attention to them. You just glance in their direction. This is not what's taking place here. It isn't like when you're walking through the hall and somebody walks towards you and you look up and acknowledge, acknowledge them just by smiling or nodding your head, but you keep going, you're not noticing them. That's not what took place here. What took place here was Jesus looked at him with a searching glance. Jesus looked deeply into his eyes. And as Jesus is searching him with his eyes, as he's looking deeply into his eyes, it's one of those moments of recognition because the apostle has been saying, I don't know him. I swear to God, may God strike me dead on the spot if I know him. And when he's saying that, he looks up and they're bringing Jesus who's been beaten. And it's got to be true. What has happened is, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ looking at him. It's a reminder. It's a reminder in the heart of the apostle Peter that just, just a little while before... 
I was just swearing to you that I would die for you. And look at what I just did. It, it had to pierce his heart. It had to pierce his heart. It had to. This look, it, it, it drove deeply into his soul. It, it broke him. You hear me say this every time we look at this message, every time we look at this passage. What kind of look do you think that Jesus was giving him? Some people think that he was looking at him with a, a harshness, an anger, judgmental. I don't believe that for an instant. I believe that Jesus was looking at him with love. With all, I believe that with all my heart. With all of my heart. There have been times in my life when, when I've done wrong and I fully expect the person that is hurt with me to look at me with anger and disgust because of what I am and what I've done. As a matter of fact, I probably, and there were times in my young life when I probably would have been, I'd have felt good about it. I'd have been glad that they treated me that way because I deserved it. The things that have broken me hasn't been when people have looked at me with anger because I deserved for them to be angry. I mean, it bothered me that I did something wrong, but it hasn't ever been those times because I kind of figure, well, you're being mad at me is pretty much the punishment enough. The thing that has been more difficult has been when the person that I have hurt has looked at me with love, with compassion and mercy. That's what's broken me. That's, that's what's caused me to say, I don't ever want to hurt you again. Early in uh, our marriage, I had a lot to learn, still do, of course. But there were times when I would say something to my, my new wife that were, it was just too direct. It was even mean-spirited. And I could, I could say things without even, without even thinking, to be honest with you. It just, and I wasn't thinking. I just said what was on my mind. And I'll never forget one time when I was, we were just, Marie and I hadn't been married a year. And I said something to her, and she was a young girl. I call her my little girl. She was, she was a young girl, and I said something mean. And, and Maria doesn't fight back. She never has. I mean, if we have a fight, I have to start it. She, she's not one who starts fights, you know. And then I said something to her, and I'll never forget her little broken voice as she said to me, you hurt me, and the tears and the sorrow. And I remember looking at her saying, I don't really care. So what? And the Lord pierced me. I have never forgotten that. It's been over 30 plus years now. I've never forgotten that. And I've said, that isn't the way you treat the person you love. That isn't how you treat them. And you know, Marie didn't look at me with hatred. You know, after, after she had cried and it hurt her and everything, and I came in, you know, I'm expecting her to be mad at me. I deserve it. She looked at me with a loving heart the loving eye, and that pierced my soul. I understand the look of love. I do. I understand that because I've received it. Not only have I received that, I've given that. I've given that same look to my kids. When they've done something that has been hurtful and embarrassing, when they would have expected Dad to be angry, and, and Dad has been, but I have looked at him with that love that disarms, that breaks, that look of, of sorrow, of grief. When Jesus looked at the apostle Peter, Jesus searchingly looked into the eyes of the man he, he called the rock, a man who loved him with all of his heart, but was a man of flesh prone to failure, prone to speaking things that were much beyond his ability to fulfill, impetuous as the day is long, but loved Jesus so much. 
And Jesus looks at him. And as Peter's eyes are locked in the gaze of Jesus, he can see Jesus' bruises. He can see he's been mistreated. It's possible that he can see the spittle on his face. And something happened. And the Bible tells us what happened. It says it in verse 61 and 62. It says, Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and he cried his eyes out. He went out and he wept bitterly. Cried his eyes out. When it's all said and done, like an explosion, and you're standing there and it's all done, you have to ask the question, how did this happen? How did I get there? What steps had the apostle Peter taken in order to get to the place where he would end up denying Jesus Christ? Well, we've already seen it. One, he overestimated his own strength. He overestimated his own strength, and, and that resulted in him having a confidence in his own flesh. He had a, a higher regard for his own loyalty and love for Jesus Christ than he had for the word of Christ. Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But the apostle Peter said, no, you've got to be wrong. Well, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. Peter failed to remember that he was a man of the flesh. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, the apostle Paul said it this way. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. The apostle Peter yielded to the inclinations of his flesh. He regarded his own strength as being sufficient and denied Jesus' word, and as a result of that, his pride brought him low. Secondly, he was following Jesus at a distance. He wanted to be identified and yet was unwilling to be fully identified as one of his followers. And as a result of that, out of fear and perhaps a bit of shame of being identified in that way, well, he followed him at a distance. I really believe, especially in these last days, that, that Christians have to be open and vocal about our faith in Christ. I, I really think it's a big mistake when we try to hide that light under a bushel. We, we need to remember that the candle is lit to be placed on a lampstand in order that all in the house might illum be illuminated by that light. But when we, when we fail to, to say, this is who I am and this is who I worship, and, and I'm not saying that we, we push it down people's throats, but, but when God gives us opportunity to stand up for him, when we want to be a closet believer, a chameleon Christian, when we want to blend in with the, with the guys at the workplace and, and, or the students at school and, and, and also that we can be part of that group and all, we're making a big mistake. We have to, we have to allow people to know who we are and who we believe in. We don't follow Jesus at, at a distance, and yet he did. He, he was unwilling to be closely identified with him. Then a third thing that he did is he tried to blend in there with the world. That's what it says in verse 55. Basically, it says, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, sat down together, Peter sat among them, blending in there with the world, standing near the fire. And that's when he was first identified. In trying to blend with the world, he put himself in the position of rejecting Jesus Christ. Again, you heard me say this recently. I see this, say this often. We, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Our lives are to be distinguishable, and our lives ought to be a contrast with the world. And, and, and the things that we believe and the things that we do ought to be things that, that result in the glory, glory that is given to God. Our light is to shine in such a way that men see our good works and glorify our God who's in heaven. I would ask you, I would encourage you, I would ask you and encourage you to be open in your faith with Jesus Christ, to be aware of the fact that, that you can make your identification known. You can, you can, you, you got to get in the Word. I was talking to Marie this, about this just the other day. I was talking to the guys about this yesterday in a meeting. But I said, I want to identify with the Lord. I, I want people to know who I identify with, and, and, and I'm very careful who I allow to influence me. 
in, in matters of morality and, and all I said, I was telling Marie, I said, you know, pretty much anything that, you know, um, Madonna believes is probably everything I disagree with by and large, you know, and whoever they endorse for whatever is probably somebody I'd be very suspicious of just because of the difference of the way that I see things. You know, Bruce Springsteen and, and uh, you know, Barbara Streisand and, and, uh, and you can go on, George Clooney and so many others that people take cues from are the people that I have suspicions about because I know that their lives don't reflect the things that I want my life to, to line up with. I want to identify with the things of the Lord, and therefore what I do is I try to identify with those who have identified with Jesus. I don't want to blend in with the world. I don't want to be all cool and everything like the world. What I want to do is have a life that's distinguishable. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Peter said it this way. He said, we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, drinking parties, revelries, heresies, idolatries, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. We spend enough of our life living like that. There's no reason for us to continue doing that. Don't blend in with the world. A fourth thing about this is that he wasn't prepared for a subtle challenge. When you study this and you look in John chapter 18, you see that there are questions that were posed to him that were posed in such a manner that it was easy for him to say, for him to say no. He was given an easy route to deny. But the last question that was given to him was really like a trap. John 18, 26, the question says, did I not see you in the garden with him? It was like a trap. You now need to say who you're identified with. Did I not see you with him? And that's when the apostle Peter denies it. And so when that direct challenge occurred, he completely denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's when he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And that rooster crowed. He failed him. His heart was broken. He went out and he cried. Psalm 30 verse 5 says this, his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping endures for a night. Joy comes in the morning. All of us have opportunities in our lives to come to a point, a crossroad, where you make a decision as to who you're going to follow. I've shared this with you before. I'll say it in almost closing. I've got a couple thoughts to give to you, but as I'm moving towards a closing here, <clears throat> that crossroads for, my, for me was in uh, 1973. Cinco de Mayo weekend that was spent in Ensenada with two army buddies. I had gotten out of the military <clears throat> and two of my friends had gotten out also. And we were hanging around and I've shared this with you. And we went from Newport Beach to the border and drank two cases of beer between the three of us. By the time we got to Ensenada and went to the bars, well, we just spent the rest of the night drinking tequila and beer. And I did that for the whole weekend, from Friday to Sunday. We were absolutely crazy for three days. I had walked away from the Lord. I just didn't realize how far I'd gotten. And then I came home, and I was in my mom's house, my mom and dad's house, and I was at the kitchen table, and I was absolutely, you know, I had a headache, my mouth was dry, tongue was swollen, I'd been drinking for three days. And my sister Madeline, whom I had led to Christ the day I got saved. She's the first person who ever came to the Lord through my witness. 
is there at my kitchen table with me and she's seated across from me and she's looking at me and I'm I'm 22 years old. And she says, did you have a good time? And I'm looking at her, hungover, still pretty, pretty drunk. It was a Sunday early afternoon. And I said to her, yeah, I had a great time, man. I haven't ever, I haven't, oh, I had a great time. She said, what did you do? Oh, you know, we did this and we did that. And I started telling her all that I did, and she's just looking at me with a look of disappointment. I was not only her big brother, but I was much more than that to her, her best friend. And as I looked at her, I began to laugh. You know, that, that bravado, that, like, oh, I had a good time, you know, I'm tough. You know, yeah, that was the attitude. And then I started to weep. I'll never forget it. I broke down at that table, and I wept. I just wept. I said, Madeline, I am absolutely miserable. I walked away from Jesus. I can't take this. Do you know that when I was in Mexico, I was drunk, and I found a, a Bible track, and I picked it up, and I handed it to a guy, and I was going to try and witness to him while I was drunk. Yeah. What a hypocrite, huh? What a hypocrite. I cried. I wept bitterly, bitterly. And I went to church. There was an evangelist at the church I went to, Mario Murillo, and he gave an invitation for you backsliders. And I stood up, and I said to the Lord, God, forgive me a sinner. I know what it feels like to deny the Lord. I know the pain that you go through and that you cause other people, the disappointment that you see in the eyes of those who love you and respect you, the hurt that you put people through. I, I know that. See, I like to be open to you guys. I don't want you to think that I'm sinless. God knows I'm not. And you might as well know it too. You already do. But I know the grace of God too. I know the grace of God. It's his mercy that's renewed every morning that I rely on. Not, not works of righteousness, which I have done. I rely on his mercy, and every day I cast myself on it. And God is merciful. You see, the apostle Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, you will deny me, but he had forgotten that Jesus had said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. See, he forgot that Jesus said, I have prayed for you. And you want to know what? Perhaps I have some in this room who have forgotten that Jesus is praying for you too because the writer of Hebrews tells us he ever lives to make intercession for us. He is our high priest, and he's still praying for us to this day. And he's praying for you the way that he has prayed for me, that my strength would not fail and that I would return to him and that I would strengthen my brethren. 
And that's what I try to do from this pulpit. Is I, I try to strengthen you because I've received that strength myself. We're all a bunch of sinners in need of God. We're all a bunch of sinners in need of God. And we fail him in thought, in word, and in deed. But it doesn't surprise him because he still looks at us with that love and it still breaks us and it still brings us home. And that's what happened to the apostle Peter. He went and he wept bitterly, but he returned to Jesus. And that's what the Lord would have for us.